Hello everyone, Avid Assistant here, and I'm here today to give you the rundown on the latest version of Avid Media Composer 2024.12. Now, I know what you may be thinking, it is now February of 2025, why are we getting 2024.12? But, as you can imagine with any kind of software development, when it's in its beta stages, they can find bugs, they can find issues, and release dates get pushed and pushed in order to fix those. And I suspect that a large part of the reason why this particular release of Media Composer took so many beta versions and took so long to perfect uh, is the fact that it is now native to Apple Silicon. Finally! So as per usual, I'm going to give a rundown on everything that's new. Now there isn't too many new additions other than native support for Apple Silicon, but we do have a couple of nice little new additions, like the ability to pause transcriptions while we're editing, um, so that you're not using up all your CPU power while you're trying to cut, and thus slowing down your Avid. And as well, finally having audio waveforms in the source monitor in your composer window. Now this is a feature that I know many Avid users have been crying out for for a very, very long time, um, and is definitely um, going to make a number of people happy. Now, as you may be able to tell, I'm feeling very, very under the weather at the moment, got a bad case of COVID, and so I'm going to keep this video as brief as I can. And so with that in mind, let's get into it. Now I've been testing this Media Composer release, both running it through Rosetta and natively on ARM. And I have to say that the main difference that I notice when running it natively is that the UI is just snappier. You know, opening of bins, loading the application, um, uh, progress bars, like just even even the look of progress bars just looks smoother. It's no longer kind of a jittery moving across. It's, it's a smooth motion uh, as it goes. I mean, just check out the speed of the application launch here. It's, it's nice. Now, I personally haven't noticed too much of a difference in things like renders and encoding and export time and stuff like that. Here I have a short film of a runtime of just under 15 minutes. I'm exporting to 12 megabits a second H.264 and it exported in about six minutes or so. So less than half of real time, which is sort of what I've been averaging anyway for, for a while. I mean, since the introduction of the UME engine a few years ago, I haven't been re-encoding anything after exporting it from Avid. I've been doing it straight from Avid because the speeds have been significantly better. Now, something I know a lot of people were curious about once we got native support for Silicon would be improvements to Avid's um, script sync and AI features and, you know, the, the transcription features. And I think I'm going to need a bit more time to properly test that. I'm going to need to bring in a few projects, uh, let it transcribe all the material, see how it goes. Um, so far it has been going pretty solid, um, I didn't have too many issues with this before. The only time I had an issue with it since it was introduced was when I joined a project midway through and um, there, there was tons and tons and tons of rushes and so my Avid was locked up transcribing all of this for ages. But with improvements we've got in the last few versions like, like selecting which bins get transcribed and you know the new addition of pause transcription while editing that's no longer a problem that we really need to deal with. If I was in the same position now, I would just turn on pause transcription while editing, work away and then leave my machine when I'm done. Um, and after 10 seconds of inactivity, transcription will kick back in again and it will fire away. So it won't hog up all of your CPU power while you're trying to work. Now moving on to a demo of our next feature in this release, which is uh, waveforms in the source monitor. So you can see I've got a clip loaded up here. I've used a sub clip where I have synced all the audio tracks. So we've got everything here that you can see. Um, I've, I've loaded up the clip. And then all I'm gonna do is right click in my source monitor and I'm gonna go to waveforms, show waveforms. And so as soon as I hit that, it changes to this. So, so here I can see all of the tracks in this clip. I get the information of the, the channel that they're from. I get a live waveform. And if you use your uh, zoom in, zoom out keys, the same keys that you have mapped for zooming in and out on your timeline, you can zoom in and out here as well. And you'll have a waveform map of the entire clip down the bottom here. Um, and you can click and drag to move around to a specific area of the waveform that you can see. So if I want to get this, this loud line that's shouted here, I can just hover over there. Morning, and welcome one and all. Now this waveform map at the bottom here allowing you to always, even if you zoom in to see the, the, the full clip um, as a waveform, you can disable that as well if you want to. Um, down in that same right click waveforms menu, turn off waveform map. Um, and then 
all of your tracks will resize automatically to fit the space. And then you can still navigate the whole thing just by using scroll bar at, at the bottom here, as we always have. Um, but I, I quite like that way format. So whenever I'm using this feature, I always leave it up. And what this will mean for me is I'm probably going to be using my old methodology of toggling my uh, timeline to the source or record a lot less since this was exactly what I was doing that for. It was to see waveforms, to mark a specific region, and then toggle back to the record in the timeline and cut it in. I'll probably still use that out of habit for a while, but given that this is so much neater and we can keep our timeline, you know, just the, the record side or edit, and they have allowed a button that we can map to toggle this on and off, I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up using this now more often. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Now, if this looks like um, something that would be of particular interest to you, then I would suggest going to the command palette and it's under play show video waveform. Um, mapping that to a key or, or putting it on your UI, um, since I find doing right clicks is just a bit too finicky for me, it's, uh, you know, if I'm working quickly. So um, yeah, I'd map that to a button. But that is a very welcome addition. Thank you, Evan. And lastly, in terms of new features, I know I mentioned it earlier, but you can pause transcription while you're editing. And to do that, go into your project settings, transcript, and click this tick box here. Pause background transcription while editing. And this just means that while you're working on your timeline, you're, you're doing stuff, you're working away, all CPU power will be reserved for what you're doing. And then as soon as you're inactive or not actively working for 10 seconds, it will resume the transcription um, and, you know, work away. Now, well, that does cover us for like new features, features that have been added in this long-term maintenance release. I'd like to say a couple of points on compatibility and updates and bug fixes. So in terms of compatibility, the Media Composer is now fully compatible with the latest and greatest operating systems of the latest Windows and macOS Sequoia. However, with that being said, Avid Nexus is not yet compatible with Sequoia. So if you have a machine that you're going to be bringing into a facility to use, or if you're managing a facility with multiple Avids, you'll, you'll want to hold off for now jumping to Sequoia. Nexus support for Sequoia is due very soon. I believe the target is before NAB this year, um, but it is not currently there as of yet. That is the reason why I am still on macOS Sonoma. Um, there is not any kind of major need for me to, to up, update at this point anyway, uh, but anybody who's thinking of updating or getting a brand new Mac that will come with Sequoia, um, just know that you won't be able to use your Avid with um, Avid Nexus. Um, just yet, um, uh, until Nexus is, is updated and support is given for uh, that Mac OS. Also, on the note of compatibility, if you're going to be using this version on Apple Silicon and you plan on using um, a Blackmagic breakout box, uh, like a Ultra Studio Mini, uh, which is what I'm using, you will need to update to the latest version of Blackmagic Desktop Video Driver, which is now a universal native Silicon app that will you know pair well with this version. Um, and you can see here, um, that it is is working away for me just fine. So this is desktop video 14.4.1 came out on the 28th of January. Uh, that's the that's the one you want. And if you're using an Asia breakout box instead of a Blackmagic one, their desktop software version 17.1.3 is also a fully Apple Silicon native app and ready to go. And uh, as per usual, a huge thank you to the Avid developers, not just for these new features, but for all these bug fixes that they've done in this version, um, including some stuff that I had run into a few times while working, which was issues with the print bin function, issues with MP3 files not batch re-importing on a system without QuickTime, uh, issues with adding markers on the fly during playback, which was causing crashes. So them and many others, you know, uh, this page and all of this page um, have all been fixed. Now in this readme doc that is released with this uh, version of Media Composer, there was also a number of existing bugs that are mentioned with suggested workarounds while they try and fix it. Remember this is a long-term maintenance release as all .12 versions are, so it will continue to receive uh, bug fix support and new versions um, into, into the future for the next couple of years, um, unlike all other versions of Media Composer. That's why your .12s are generally your, your safest bet, because you can do incremental updates to keep safe from all that stuff, but without having to worry about new versions, introducing new code and new issues. 
Plus, as always, I always recommend creating a fresh new user profile um, when updating to any version of Media Composer. And I've linked below a short video on um, how to port your settings over when you create the new user profile um, to save you a whole lot of time when, when you're doing that. You don't have to rebuild everything from scratch. You can bring over your keyboard and stuff like that. Plus, I personally always like to run the Avid uninstaller, uninstall the current version, and then download the new installer from Avid's website in the download center and run it that way. I do find you get a much cleaner install, um, you know, with better performance than if you try and do an update via Avid Link. I've never really trusted that process, not just with Avid, but with any other app. So yeah, that is the, the last thing I'll say here in this video. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'm going to go try and get some rest now. Um, uh, thank you very much for everybody to, to tuning in and watching this. I hope you enjoy the new version. And especially thank you to Patreon subs and channel subscribers. There will be more original content coming your way very soon. Just as soon as I get better and I, and I can finish it. I've recorded some stuff, but I just need, need, need to get better. I need to get my head right. Um, and then I can complete that stuff and it'll be all, all up and ready for you. So that'll be coming your way really, really soon. Uh, but for now, that is me, guys. I will... S but for now, that is me, signing off. See you in the next video.